Okay. So I'm going to start off uh, this morning's session talking about uh, some uh, where we are and uh, also where we'd like to go, um, both from the material science perspective and the computer science perspective in materials modeling, and particularly uh, multi-scale or scale bridging algorithms. Uh, as we look ahead to the type of architectures that Jeff Federer will uh, describe in his talk a little bit later. Um, so first, I never thought I'd say this, but it's nice to come to DC for the fresh air. Uh, we've had a couple months of smoke from Arizona and, and even more closely recently, so uh, uh, things are finally calming down there. Uh, but it is also nice to come back to this conference uh, and having been at the first uh, few CSGF conferences back uh, too long ago, um, it, it's really good to be back and, and to uh, interact with all of you. Um, so first I'll kind of set the stage of where we are. Um, the, the workload, uh, the workhorse uh, of most computational material science research are still in single scale um, uh, materials applications. Um, Several of these have been among the, the first uh, applications ported to, to each new type of machine. So as BlueGene and Roadrunner and, and various architectures came along, some of the first applications there were, uh, came from these single scale applications. So, so it's uh, kind of instructive to review some of these and also kind of for those of you, those of you who were at the last year's HPC workshop, uh, kind of remind you of some of the stuff uh, Fred Streitz had covered in his talk. So, you kind of have to be careful. A lot of times uh, people will refer to multi-scale materials modeling, but what they're referring to is a kind of a more traditional sequential approach where you use lower link scale models uh, and calculations to develop models, uh, constitutive models and uh, parameters that then you feed into higher link scale models. And there's a really beautiful example of this um, in a paper recently published by Nathan Barton and uh, colleagues from Livermore. Uh, on this multi-scale strength model that, that use exactly such an approach. So starting at the lowest scale uh, where um, uh, ab initio calculations are, are used um, uh, to solve the Schrodinger equation for materials under various uh, pressure and temperature and, and uh, strain conditions uh, to develop parameters like the, uh, the force model that you might use in a molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, the equation of state that you might use in, in a continuum calculation, so, so how the material energy and, and stress depends on uh, uh, the, the strain and temperature, uh, and various parameters like that. Uh, so, so these types of codes at the ab initio scale, I'll, I'll say a little bit more in the next uh, slide, but, but they're, um, as you may be familiar, that they're uh, typically solving showing your equation using a basis set uh, for, for periodic systems uh, like materials, uh, typically with a periodic basis set of plane waves. Uh, and this involves a lot of Fourier transforms and various uh, uh, numerical algebra that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. So then at the next scale, uh, MD is, uh, classical MD uh, is, is, now we're going from, from the quantum scale of uh, nanometers and picoseconds. Uh, with MD, we jump up to, to length and time scales um, with kind of pushing it on, on uh, some of the largest machines up, up to microns and nanoseconds uh, if, if need be. Uh, and here using these force fields that have been developed from the ab initio modeling, uh, we study things like the defect uh, nucleation and growth, um, interface mobility, uh, uh, the, the uh, instability development and various things. Uh, and this, of course, molecular dynamics is just involving particles. Uh, so now instead of a mesh, we, we have a set of particles that, that we propagate. Um, and it's a very simple algorithm, so, so it actually gives us the opportunity to, to explore things like Fred talked about last year, uh, of how we do things uh, such as uh, various load balancing strategies, uh, some, some uh, resilience strategies, recovering from parity errors, um, and then also with, s since we're typically we may be doing billions uh, to tens or even hundreds of billions of, of atoms. Uh, this also pushes the limits on visual, visualization and how, if we, when we have these massive data sets uh, in situ, how do we do analysis while we have the data? Uh, how do we uh, uh, do visualization and, and kind of cull down the amount of information, do some data reduction uh, because it's just be becoming increasingly impractical to, to checkpoint uh, say a trillion atom system. Uh, th this really stresses the, the I.O. system and you don't want to spend all of your computation time 
doing I.O. Um, so, so more and more uh, in situ work is needed. So again, using, using the MD simulations, uh, you come up with things such as for, for, for metals, where the, the mechanical response uh, is determined by line defects called dislocations. So uh, when the crystal planes slip over each other, it leaves a dislocation. Uh, those are kind of the fundamental properties in a metal. Um, or you may have the material changing its, its crystalline phase as in iron. Um, so at a mesoscale, uh, now jumping up to say hundreds of microns and nanoseconds, uh, depending on what problem you're interested in, uh, you may use phase fields to, to model evolving uh, phase transformations or in, in, simple, in pure metallic systems, uh, dislocation dynamics to model the, the evolution of dislocations. And whichever one of those you use, uh, these kind of determine things like the, um, uh, the phase fraction growth, the, uh, the stress-strain relationship, and then those finally are fed into the continuum level models uh, where you, you need a, a constitutive stress-strain re uh, response uh, to, to drive the, the mechanical behavior. And then kind of closing the loop here, we're now back at uh, algorithms that are driven by uh, things like FFTs, uh, dominated by uh, things like FFTs uh, in the case of some of the um, uh, polycrystal plasticity models. So again, this, uh, this paper kind of carried through the, this entire sequence uh, for the case of some uh, tantalum and vanadium um, uh, uh, metals under shock loading uh, and directly compared going all the way for, from the ab initio scale up to the continuum scale modeling the experiments. Uh, okay, so, so just a little bit more on each of these fundamental algorithms and I realize I pulled most of these from Livermore. so. Uh, we'll get to some Los Alamos work in a second. Uh, so, so down at the electronic structure scale, um, it, again, if, if we're for, for materials unlike chemical systems where uh, in chemistry it's typically gas phase and we use uh, localized orbitals and materials uh, and metals looking at periodic systems, so uh, plane wave basis sets are used. But we're still solving the Schrodinger equation uh, now with this plane wave set. Um, using an effective potential so that we don't have to solve for all of the electrons. Um, uh, and then, you know, it's uh, on its face a fairly simple equation that we're solving, but, but already it, it uh, kind of points out an issue that, that's um, pretty general for, for other algorithms and also architectures in that the different parts of this, this equation um, have uh, ideal representations that, that make their solution simple. So, um, so in this case, the, the kinetic and potential terms, um, they're sparse in either the uh, momentum or, or real space. So in, instead of sticking to one or the other, you go back and forth all the time with, with uh, F, FFTs. Um, and so this type of uh, optimal data representation and uh, layout uh, is also an issue, as we'll see with MD in a minute, when you consider hybrid architectures where you have different uh, types of processors and there may be, well, it turns out there are di um, different layouts and uh, organizations that you would like for, for different parts of, of an algorithm as simple as MD. Um, let's see, th there's also some complexity here in just maintaining orthogonality uh, that also adds some linear algebra. And then one other point is uh, some of the nice work that they did leading to a Gordon Bell Prize was um, showing that the optimal uh, decomposition strategy wasn't really obvious. Um, ahead of time, you might do a simple uh, default spatial decomposition that uh, gives a reasonable performance. Then something like, well, you, it's, it makes sense. You may want to minimize the surface to volume ratio uh, to minimize the amount of communication that actually leads to a slightly worse performance. And these more uh, odd-looking um, decomposition strategies actually lead to the optimal performance. Uh, so the point of this is, th is that sometimes um, uh, it, it, well, in general, it pays to, to kind of keep your mind open and have the flexibility to optimize um, uh, things other than just the mathematical kernel. Uh, so again, as Jeff's going to talk about with, with the architectures, we're moving towards the era where it's not the math, it's not the um, flops that are limiting us. Uh, it's more data communication. It's a lot harder to optimize uh, things like this than it is simple mathematical kernels. Um, 
Okay, so jumping up to the next scale, the classical MD, um, this is just a brief reminder of, of uh, some of what Fred talked about last, last year with the uh, DDC MD code. Um, there are various ways of doing uh, decomposition from molecular dynamics. Uh, you can do a spatial decomposition, is in the, the code I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, in this case, it's a particle-based decomposition. Uh, when you go to more complex force fields, uh, say biological systems, uh, then sometimes you go to a bond-based uh, decomposition where, where you, uh, you can even have more processes than particles. Uh, and so the examples like that are the, uh, um, uh, the work at D.E. Shaw with the Anton machine and, uh, uh, and their MD code there. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, there, there are uh, the fairly simple algorithm, although you can make it more complex with more complicated potential functions. Uh, but if you look at things like embedded atom method potentials or essentially pairwise interactions, uh, it's a simple enough algorithm that you can explore things like how do you how do, you do uh, uh, parity error recovery. Uh, in this case, they showed that, that just by periodically storing in memory snapshots of the, the current system state, the atomic positions and velocities, then if there's, there's an uh, a parity error detected, you can just back up and, and do an in-memory uh, restart. So to speak, uh, and this is also possible because the the memory footprint of these uh, MD simulations is, is quite small. Uh, yeah. Okay. So finally, um, going up to the mesoscale and, and uh, one more example. So I, I mentioned in the case of metals that the mechanical response is, is driven by the uh, these line defects dislocations. So there, instead of modeling the entire Atomic system, uh, you can just focus on the dislocations and the interactions between them and their evolution and nucleation and growth uh, and reaction processes. Uh, so Paradis is kind of the state of the art, well, is the state of the art of um, these types of simulations uh, where you discretize these line defects into, into either nodes or segments. Uh, do a time step algorithm where you compute the forces um, that each of these line segments exerts on the other and uh, uh, propagate forward. Uh, in the case of dislocations, they're complicated by the uh, what happens when dislocations interact and how they can uh, have different reactions. And so this uh, leads to some complicated junction formation as you start out with a simple uh, few dislocation lines and material and stress the system. They multiply and grow, uh, form these junctions, and eventually get uh, some complicated mess. And actually, this is what limits how far you can push these simulations is uh, just the dislocation density in your system uh, that you need to resolve. Um, as, as you notice, as these grow, you tend to get uh, a fairly uh, inhomogeneous distribution of these in space. Uh, so, so how to actually balance these among uh, processors is a challenge. Uh, so this was some of the early work I <clears throat> on blue gene for this, uh, going from, excuse me, 4,000 to 8,000 processors, <clears throat> there's a fairly good speed up, uh, 1.8, nearly two. But then doubling that again, the, the added gain began to diminish. So it's, it's difficult to uh, push these, these uh, much forward in, part, in large part because of this uh, challenge of the load balancing issue and uh, the, the evolution of this uh, dislocation structure. Okay, so. Jumping back now to MD, I'm going to use uh, the code that we, we've been working on at Los Alamos called SPASM as an example, uh, in large part because of the experience we had taking this, porting it through a number of um, evolutions in architectures, and then finally coming to the radically new types of architectures, such as Roadrunner, where instead of just uh, a homogeneous collection of processors, now we have to consider different processor types, um, a more hierarchical structure, uh, and also a great change since uh, the, the days when this code was originally developed uh, from the, mem the ratio, the relative importance of computation and communication. Um, so again, here it's the simple MD algorithm. Uh, instead of decomposing, um, uh, setting up your list of particles and dividing that um, among processors. We divide uh, space among processors. 
uh, which in this case is, is reasonable because we're usually looking at fairly homogeneous systems. So we, a simple spatial decomposition is, uh, is good. Um, and then to, to do a rapid search to find the atoms, the interacting atoms with each neighbor, uh, you further subdivide space into these sub subdomains uh, that are the size of the interaction distance of the potential. Uh, so this has, again, been used over many, many architectures and, and pushed up to uh, a, t a trillion atoms, again, because of the, fairly, the very small memory footprint of MD simulations, just the particle, the positions and velocities of, of each atom are all that need to be, be stored. So the types of things uh, that we've studied with this are, are, are a lot of high deformation loading. So in this case, uh, a shock wave propagating through an iron polycrystal. So the atoms here are, uh, try this again. The atoms are colored by their, their local orientation or local coordination. Uh, so the gray atoms are in a, a body-centered cubic lattice structure. As the shock wave compresses them, you can see that this uh, blue region where the, it's just the BCC lattice compressed as the shock goes along. But then there's, there's a transformation to a new, a close-packed phase, uh, HCP, which are the red atoms. And then this can occur in two different variants. So, so we have uh, these, these twin boundaries between the two variants. Um, so things like this are used to, to study um, the, uh, the mechanism of the phase transformation, the kinetics for feeding into higher link scale models of the transformation, uh, the properties, uh, say the mechanical properties of the new phase, uh, and other things such as these. Um, one thing I want to point out here is the importance of, again, visualization in situ, both for uh, seeing what's going on physically, um, trying to identify new mechanisms uh, and evaluate them. But it's also been important for, um, for debugging code in a lot of cases. A lot of times there may be bugs that, that rarely pop up, but uh, you can do th things to identify, say, uh, in some cases, we've, we found problems along uh, particular processor boundaries by uh, using visualization techniques to identify where the, the, uh, the numerical problem originally occurs uh, uh, using these visualizations. And then they're also good for um, kind of communicating the work and uh, uh, especially to experimentalists we've collaborated with on some of this and, and uh, uh, describing the, uh, the work. So how big is big enough? Um, for the case of, of materials like this, uh, in the case of polycrystal materials like I just showed, uh, there's a well-known behavior where the, the strength of the material depends on the grain size. So, so in the um, kind of large engineering scale limit, uh, it's been known for over 50 years that, that as you decrease the grain size of the material, the, the mechanical strength goes up uh, is the inverse square root of that grain size. Um, so that's led the drive towards more nanostructured, nanoscale materials. Uh, but eventually that reaches some limit because if you go down to, to a grain size of a single atom, that's just an amorphous material and it's known amorphous materials are, are fairly weak. So, so there has to be some turnover region here. Uh, and it's been kind of predicted by models and then shown by both experiments and, uh, and, and simulations that this turnover is actually uh, in the region of, of a, f uh, a few nanometers to a few tens of nanometers. So if we want to model a system like this completely atomistically, uh, say we need at least uh, 100 grains, uh, diameter 50 nanometers, that puts us in the billion atom uh, length scale. Uh, if all you want to do is propagate a sound wave through that, just a sound or shock wave through that sample, um, it takes at least uh, or on the order of, of a nanosecond time scale. Uh, but typically you, you, you uh, uh, need to, you're interested in uh, longer time phenomena, so time scales may be nanoseconds to microseconds. Uh, with MD, that puts us in the uh, millions of time steps to perhaps a billion time steps. So, so these are kind of the limits of what can be done with a single scale application. Um, so finally, uh, on the single scale aspect, I was going to uh, just kind of walk you through our experience taking a, a, a simple application such as this 
and porting is was kind of the naive word, but trying to, to rewrite that for, for new architectures, uh, how we do this. And the motivation, of course, is that um, uh, over the years, uh, there's been a great growth in, in the, in the uh, performance of uh, GPUs and other uh, types of accelerators relative to, to the conventional CPUs. So on chips, they've been adding more and more processors to CPUs. Uh, but then there's also the, the opportunity of exploiting the, the GPUs for additional acceleration. Um, these, in, in the case of Roadrunner, the choice was made to, to, to use the, uh, the cell processor that was in the PlayStation. Um, it's actually somewhat resembles in some ways the old uh, connection machine, the CM5 from back when I was working in, in the CSGF program. Um, where the CM5 had these, these eight vector units um, and uh, I guess a performance of a whole one entire gigaflop. As we jump forward to the cell, it's a 100 gigaflop processor uh, with these eight uh, so-called synergistic processing elements. Um, so again, a main uh, power PC processor and these eight SPEs. Uh, and how you get those to work together is the question. Um, Actually, in the case of Roadrunner, uh, since the cell processor for, for the, the PlayStation didn't really need a lot of, um, didn't use this power PC very much, it, it was stripped down. And a lot of things, uh, branch prediction, and a lot of uh, the power of the, of the power PC was taken away. So it's essentially worthless from a, a scientific computing standpoint. So for Roadrunner, um, in addition to the cells, uh, the op, uh, 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 some host nodes, uh, Optron processors were added. So Roadrunner, uh, which again is the first petaflop machine, is, is this kind of hybrid cluster of clusters. Uh, so a, a number of these so-called connected units were assembled together in this hierarchical network. Within each connected unit, uh, there's a one-to-one -one mapping um, uh, between Optron cores and cell processors. So how do we get those, how, how do we take our algorithm, which is originally written for something looking like this without the, accelerate, the cell accelerators, and optimize that for this, this now hybrid architecture. Um, so the idealized picture uh, of doing this, and again, coming from some of the, the gaming and graphics communities, is um, you have a number of tasks that you need to do uh, on, the, on the cell. Um, and and you do, if you can write these in such a way that you can uh, um, overlap the, the data flow, data feed down to the cell and then up to the, to the uh, or down to the SPEs and up to the, the, power, the PPE, or in our case, all the way up to the CPU, if you can overlap that communication with the computation that's going on down on the SPEs, then you get it, uh, you can amortize it and, and don't have to worry about that uh, communication time. So ideally you have these overlapped um, direct memory address instructions uh, and computations, uh, so you can double or triple buffer uh, the incoming data, the data you're working on, and the outgoing data, um, and again, hide this, this computation time. Um, when it actually, comes to, to taking that idealized picture and then applying it to, to your real scientific code, it, it became much more of a challenge uh, because, as I mentioned, in this case, we have not only the two types of processors on the cell, also these opterons. Um, so that means three different uh, compilers, uh, different communication libraries between each of them. Um, how you synchronize the, this, this uh, Data transfer is critical, uh, and uh, actually two different types of byte orderings on top of this. So uh, when you look at Roadrunner, a Roadrunner here, you start to sort of feel like the victim here. Um, but it actually turned out to be not so bad. So walking you through this, the, um, this code that I mentioned, SPASM, it, it, it was originally written back 20 years ago for, for the connection machine. Uh, back then, memory and computation were the bottlenecks. Uh, so we had a whole uh, 32 megabytes per, per Spark node. Um, on the other hand, communication was cheap. So this is something um, 
actually for the, for the original connection machine that Richard Feynman had helped out on, uh, and then for the CM5 had taken advantage of work uh, for, for, from MIT. Um, so there was a lot of work on, on, on network topologies and structures. Um, in, in the case of the CM5, it was a fat tree. Uh, the T3D, which was slightly later, had a three-dimensional torus, which for the type of um, 3D spatial decomposition of MD is, is exactly the network that you want. Uh, nearest neighbor communication uh, to each of the, the six nearest neighbors. Um, so the algorithm that was developed to minimize the amount of memory that used was to just, uh, at any one time, only have the, the particles within a processor in memory plus one of these little subdomains from, from the adjacent processor. Uh, and then step, th just march through and lockstep each of these subdomains computing interactions between pairs of, of um, uh, between the particles within a subdomain or immediately adjacent subdomains, um, and then doing synchronous send and receives to communicate it as needed along the way. So in kind of pseudocode, this is just looping over subdomains, computing the interactions between pairs of particles within one and then with each of the uh, neighbors using these synchronous send and receives inside the, this loop. So of course, as we go forward and make the computation faster and faster uh, and communication latency slower, this overhead begins to, to dominate and you have to turn things inside out. Uh, so as we, we, we move forward to, to kind of the past uh, five to 10 years, um, uh, Memory has become, there's been more and more memory added for, is driven by a lot of the other applications, but for MD, we have memory to spare. So you can use it for uh, this in, in situ checkpointing uh, for the fault tolerance. Uh, you can use it to, to uh, buffer the entire uh, boundary cells of atoms. Uh, and, and this is known as uh, uh, ghost cells or a halo exchange uh, where you bring in all of the uh, the neighboring cells ahead of time. Uh, this leads to some redundant calculations. So computing interactions uh, that, that span a processor boundary, uh, those pairwise interactions are now computed on twice, once on each processor. Uh, but again, since uh, the, the computation communication trade-off has, has changed, that's uh, worth the payoff. So looking at an algorithm like this, uh, trying to, to think how we, we can accelerate this on a, uh, with a hybrid architecture, um, you're spending the vast majority of your time, 90%, 95%, computing forces. So it makes sense, you have this force algorithm, you just accelerate that down on the, on the cell or, or the GPU. So the original approach was to, to just take that single subroutine, accelerate it on the cell, um, as we march along, we get the, the particle positions, send them down, communicate the forces, send the forces back up, integrate time steps, do checkpointing, uh, re-sort re particles, uh, do whatever, whatever, whatever other bookkeeping we need to, uh, and march forward. And this is a typical uh, type of interaction, this embedded atom method I mentioned, uh, which is essentially a pairwise potential, uh, twice as complex, there's a, uh, well, okay, so there's a pairwise interaction that's essentially the, the in the simple picture, the internuclear repulsion, and then an attractive one for metals uh, with an electron density around each atom, and then a functional of that leads to the attractive bonding uh, when you place a nuclei within the background electron density of its neighbors. Uh, so that's the simple, simplest and, and the most widely used interaction for metals. So anyway, when we looked at this algorithm, implemented it, it actually only gave about a, a, a two and a half times speed up uh, over the base code. And the reason for this is that, again, when you look at the potential performance uh, on these different um, processing elements, the vast majority is, is down on the accelerator. So uh, to optimally use it, you really need to, to have the accelerator busy, busy as much as possible. Anytime it's sitting idle, you're just killing performance. So uh, this uh, kind of back and forth trade-off uh, of work between Opteron and Cell uh, is damaging performance. 
So then you turn around, look at it from a, um, a cell-centric, an accelerator-centric perspective. Um, it turns out now that, that when we're focused on the computation, um, or when we're focused on the wor work on the cell, again, the data layout that, that we want changes, um, whether you have uh, uh, an array of structures. Uh, so you, in, in going back, going back all the way here, uh, these interactions and communicating particles across processor boundaries, it's most convenient to have uh, each atom contiguous in memory. So an array of these uh, particle data structures uh, is optimal from a communication perspective. When it gets down to doing the, the math down on the cell, uh, it's better to have the uh, structure of arrays, so the, uh, all the positions in each direction aligned with each other, so you can just stream those through uh, and, and calculate those and vectorize those um, uh, down on the cell. So turning this around, uh, we, we looked at this from, from the cell center perspective as far as data layout, um, put uh, all of the work that we could down on the cell and then hid the, the data transfer time with, with work that we could do uh, with, with data that was already local. So, start your uh, overlap local calculations uh, with data transfer uh, to uh, hide this uh, transfer time. Doing this um, actually leads to, to now a lot of uh, dead time on the Optron, which is uh, not so bad. And it's actually useful for, for uh, things like doing in-situ analysis, visualization, checkpointing. We can, uh, again, because of the memory left over here, we, we can, uh, have checkpointing going on while, while we're continuing the time stepping uh, down on the cell. Uh, so we can overlap these. Doing this then, um, got roughly a 10 times speed up, 28% uh, of peak overall, um, and about 50% of peak in, in the actual uh, kernel uh, on, on the cell here. So this is where kind of the state is from for single scale materials applications on, on hybrid architectures. Now, finally, after this long introduction, getting to multi-scale and, and why we need to do this. So, again, one more MD example. Uh, if we're looking at something like the, the, the development of, of a fluid instability, uh, where we, we have a heavy fluid on top of a light fluid in this case, uh, or the, the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability that Fred mentioned last year. Um, we're interested in the evolution of this interface layer, which is a fairly small volume fraction of the material. So, so of all these, uh, in this case, what, seven billion atoms, um, it's really only the interface, which at early times is a very, very small fraction, and even at late times is, is, is fairly modest. It's only the interface where we need atomic resolution. Uh, in the, for the fluid away from the interface, this homogeneous, uh, this heavy red fluid on, uh, on top here, we could model that just as well with, with a continuum uh, of finite, finite element or, or some other model. Uh, we don't need atomic resolution there. It's the same thing for, for the materials problems uh, where we, in, in, that case, in the case of iron that I showed, when we have the, the shock wave propagating through the material, we don't need atomic resolution ahead of the shock wave uh, when the material's just sitting there or after it's transformed and is sitting there. We, really only need resolution in a fairly small amount. And this is becoming more and more um, apparent as we go to these larger and larger simulations. So then also if, if we kind of look where we're, we're, where we're headed as far as what we can do now in terms of time and length scales for a single scale MD application, uh, since we're resolving atomic vibrations, our time step is down at a, uh, on the order of a femtosecond. Um, of course, we're resolving it, the individual atoms. Uh, so as, as we, the, the amount of mem total amount of memory that we have in the system determines how many atoms we, we can just, we can fit in the computer. Uh, so this is up currently to, as I mentioned, roughly around a trillion atoms on the latest machines. Um, but it's, it's, pretty useless to do a trillion atoms for a few time steps, not an, even enough time for one end of the sample to propagate a sound wave to, to the other side and for them to realize 
the size of the, the entire size of the sample. Um, so typically we trade off uh, the system size for, uh, for speed and simulation time. So with short, short range potentials where we can do these types of spatial decompositions, it's, it's a simple order n algorithm. You have this linear trade off uh, between size and time until eventually you hit some limit, uh, communication limit where you're, um, where you're then memory or, or uh, communication bound and just the, the, the bookkeeping overhead f for doing individual time steps sets how fast each time step can be. So when you look at this on current machines, uh, you, you can push out to, to uh, millions, uh, perhaps a billion time steps. Uh, it, so it gets you to tens of nanoseconds. Uh, if you really push, you can go longer, but uh, there's essentially a time wall here that we're facing. As we look forward with the projections toward exascale, um, by definition, exascale is a thousand times faster than petascale. So, so this, uh, this linear scaling performance region goes up by three orders of magnitude. Uh, the current projections are memory may go up by two orders of magnitude, but communication and especially the, um, the, or the clock speeds and bandwidth, and especially relative to the number of um, uh, processing elements per, per, per node uh, isn't going up very much. It may actually uh, diminish, so, so this time scale problem is not, not increasing. So we either have to get over this by algorithms, um, e either by extending the time scale of uh, MD algorithms or by coupling scales. Uh, and I'll talk about both of these, in particular the uh, uh, kind of where we are in, in, in the state of coupling scales between these applications. So I mentioned these, uh, the first of all, the sequential multi-scale techniques where, where you just do an information transfer. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, the scientist is doing the, the, the coupling, developing the physical models that you feed into higher link scale models. Um, on the other hand, so-called concurrent techniques, in concurrent techniques, the coupling is done in situ in, in the computer. Uh, so you're linking different, different scale models, uh, different types I showed at the beginning. Um, so again, sequential multi-scale works if you have an idea ahead of time or, or can discover what the relevant processes uh, are and develop models for those. And if there is a separation of uh, uh, time and length scales between each of these so that it makes sense to say we have electrons determining the interaction between uh, nuclei, we can develop an interatomic potential for that, feed that into the next length scale, so let's use a Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Uh, and then the atoms in the material uh, lead to a mechanical response that's dominated by these dislocation line defects so we can use the line defects as our fundamental element in the next scale. That, that works, when that's true, the sequential multi-scale works great. In a lot of cases, um, uh, turbulence is one. There's a strong coupling between different, these different length scales, length and time scales. So we can't simply integrate out the small scale, the subscale degrees of freedom and feed them in the, into the course of models. So we really need a, a coupling. Um, it's also been reported out, this is a good review a few years ago by Lou and Kixeris uh, on various techniques, uh, that these models aren't just useful for uh, this in and of themselves, but also for uh, kind of developing ways to, to, to do the uh, data reduction. Uh, so, so to determine and work out how do you identify what's the essential data at the, at the fine scale that, that re is really important. So an example here, again, is in um, doing checkpoint restart. So in an MD simulation with billions to a trillion atoms, um, you don't wanna have to checkpoint to, to write out all the positions and velocities of all those atoms uh, at each checkpoint when it's only, it may only be the, the interface atoms that matter uh, away from there, you just have a, a um, either a perfect solid or a perfect fluid that, that you can just write out the uh, kind of the average state of the system there uh, and then reconstruct the atomic configuration that, that, that matches that. Uh, so this is one of the major challenges as we go forward uh, is data reduction and 
uh, it couples nicely into these, these scale bridging techniques. So um, the first type of, of methods I'll talk about, uh, and there's actually a nice, the, the, I know it's the winning essay in, in the magazine now is about, uh, referred to some of these onion methods, um, where uh, there's kind of an, an embedding of different scales, uh, a, a separation of models within the problem. So say a classic example has been fracture, where we have a crack um, propagated into a material. Away from the crack front, we, just, we may typically just have an elastic solid where we can use a, a continuum model. But at the crack tip, the crack is propagating forward by individual bond breaking events. So, so we really need atomic resolution at the crack tip. So in this case, there's a continuum region, uh, an atomistic region, and then the challenge is how do you couple these? Uh, so one common way is, is to, uh, shown on the bottom here, um, within the um, atomistic region have ghost atoms that are uh, kind of come from, that are, whose positions are determined by the finite element in the boundary region. And then the finite element region um, similarly have uh, kind of these ghost cells that come from the MD so that you can do each type of each scale of simulation uh, and then couple them through, the, through these boundary regions. Uh, in, uh, in some cases, this, is, this may be carried on not just coupling two scales, but multiple scales. So, so again, in the, in the case of a crack, you may actually need to, to describe these bond breaking events w with a quantum method or, or tight binding in this case. Uh, so there may be these multiple scales. Um, okay, so, so I'll just kind of briefly describe the, the kind of some of the more common, uh, more widely known techniques and s actually some of the historical um, ones that, that have uh, kind of played an important role in the evolution of this. Um, one is uh, so-called quasi-continuum method. Uh, again, it's coupling a finite element and, and atomic regions, uh, where the idea here is that um, uh, in, in regions, say, where we have a crack or, or dislocations on an indenter uh, driving into a material, we have a fully atomistic representation. Away from that, uh, we then only need a, f a f um, so in the center here is, is kind of shown this defect region that's fully atomistic. Further away where it's just an elastic material, we don't need full atomistic resolutions. So the dark atoms here on the left uh, are, are kind of representative atoms, these rep atoms that, that kind of give the local, um, dis describe the local elastic um, response to the material there. And then as the, the simulation moves forward, the, you, these boundary regions may evolve. Um, the number of, typically the, uh, uh, the number of fully atomistic, the size of the fully atomistic region grows until uh, it overwhelms the, the, the computer and the simulation ends there. Uh, the, a, a common theme for, for several of these early techniques is, is that um, it, it's, somewhat simple to do this in, in static situations. So if you're just finding the minimum energy uh, configuration, the, the, uh, the zero temperature static uh, solution, uh, this can be done. Adding temperature or doing dynamics in this is, is a challenge. Uh, I'll say more about this in a minute. Uh, but one, one early case where, where dynamics was done is the so-called MAD approach. Uh, Again, this is the, the three-scale coupling that I mentioned earlier, where uh, there are finite element, MD, and tight binding regions. Uh, in this case, the tight binding ahead of the crack tip, uh, right where bonds are breaking, MD around it, and then finite element furthest away. Um, in, in this case, it's, uh, it's written as a Hamiltonian, uh, w where you have uh, terms for each of the, these three single-scale regions, and then the two uh, overlap or handshaking regions are really where, where the challenge comes in and how you do this. Uh, in particular for quantum systems, how, how, you do, um, how you do a calculation of the energy of this configuration and, and treat the uh, dangling bonds between uh, with, a, with atoms that you've now cut out of the, the tight binding uh, model. 
in, in this case, uh, for silicon, it's possible to do this for covalent systems just by adding fake atoms that, that make, um, uh, uh, so solve the coordination, uh, satisfy the coordination of the silicon. It, it's more difficult to do for metals, and this is still an open question. Uh, coupling uh, um, quantum and ab initio f f for metals. Uh, f again, for the case of uh, um, covalent systems, coupling quantum and classical regions is, is widely used in chemistry in the uh, so-called quantum QMMM, uh, quantum, molec quantum mechanical uh, molecular model uh, simulations, where there are quantum and, and molecular regions, but in metals, uh, it's, it's much more challenging. So, so there's, uh, I think this is the only example uh, where, well, this, it, it's possible for, for uh, silicon. Um, so going forward um, uh, from this, uh, coupling the different regions that are in, in studying these, the behavior of these uh, scale bridging techniques, one major challenge was in this coupling region of um, having a consistent propagation of, of waves uh, or avoiding uh, spurious, I should say, reflection or, or introduction of waves from this interface region. So, so as you go from an atomistic region um, and, and then uh, course in that to, to a finite element region, uh, if you have a sound wave w with a wavelength that is less than one of the finite element cells, what happens is it goes from the atomistic region wh where it can be supported into the finite element region where it's not. Uh, having this consistent transfer across boundaries is really a big challenge. So this is something that, that there have been elegant solutions uh, for how to do this, but the problem is they're very expensive. They involve um, uh, uh, some particle history, uh, memory, uh, and then they also involve um, uh, kind of a, a they're non-local, uh, not only in, in time, but also in space, so, so they don't scale well. Uh, so you can either have a, a, uh, an approximate alg algorithm that scales well, but, but has this spurious wave reflection, or an algorithm that solves the, the wave reflection, but doesn't scale. So one approach, uh, kind of advance in this is this so-called coarse-grained MD, um, where there's a consistent transfer between the, the uh, between scales. So uh, this is written in such a way that um, uh, there's a coarse-graining of the, it's thinking of the system atomically, but then coarse-graining in, in regions where you can uh, to, to transition smoothly to a continuum uh, mesh. So in this case, there's a smooth prop transition, uh, propagation of wa elastic waves between the regions uh, and treatment of these phonon modes. Um, another advantage is this, since it's focused purely on the MD system, you don't need to worry, um, as in the case back here, about how do you have a consistent, uh, say in the case of silicon here, how do you have a consistent description of silicon in a tight binding picture versus a an MD picture versus a finite element picture, you would need a tight binding potential uh, and an MD potential and finite element description uh, constitutive model that, that are exactly compatible. So, so that's solved in, in this approach where, where you uh, are looking at everything from the, from the atomistic scale. Um, however, it's, it's a very complicated uh, intricate algorithm, it, it's been shown to be successful in, in some test simulations uh, in various test cases, but not really applied or extended beyond that. Um, so all of those are, are the so-called energy-based methods where we're coupling, we're, we're, the idea is to write down a Hamiltonian that describes the system, including these different scales. The challenge here is that these are trying to do everything at once. Um, and we're coupling time scales between regions. Uh, so this means that whatever our finest scale region is, that's the time step that we're stuck with. So if we have MD finite element, we're, our time step is gonna be an MD time step. So we we're, we're still have that time problem where we're iter propagating our system forward in steps of a femtosecond or a few femtoseconds. We're not gonna get beyond picoseconds to nanoseconds. Um, 
as I mentioned, these matching conditions at the boundaries are, are, very, are very challenging. And because of both of these, these factors, it's very difficult to do actual dynamical simulations um, at finite temperature. So there's another approach uh, by uh, E's group at Princeton uh, based on the so-called heterogeneous multiscale method, uh, where instead of trying to write down and do the coupling uh, from an energy perspective uh, and MD up, it's focused top level down. So your system is driven forward by a macro scale solver. So, so it's maybe a finite vol volume or element method. And the point of the subscale model, such as MD, is to give you, uh, as needed, the information that you need to drive this or to improve the, the model driving the, the macro scale solver forward. So this has been broken, classified uh, in their work as, um, say, two different problems. Uh, type A, where you have isolated defects uh, in, in the sample uh, and, and do so, a so-called adaptive model refinement, where around the defects, you use uh, MD to compute the properties and the, and the evolution of these defects. Or type B, where it's just the constitutive response of the material that we need that's computed on the fly. Okay. Um, so that's the state of, say, of, uh, kind of these scale bridging materials. Uh, there's a nice review comparing, actually, that are many more that, um, that are all similar in different regards, just considering coupling atomistic from continuum. Uh, there's a nice review comparing 14 of these different methods. Uh, and their performance uh, uh, on this axis is kind of the, the, the speed up that was seen. Uh, and then on, on the vertical axis here, the, the accuracy of the method, uh, a few of these, the quasi continuum that I method, mentioned earlier, were kind of found to be the, mo the optimal, both in terms of speed and accuracy. But as they point out, none of these has really been pushed to scale. So, so there's still a question of um, uh, how, they, how they transition, how, how they, what their limitations are at large scale uh, and, and how this is done. So let me skip over the time. Okay, so finally from the computational perspective and this kind of, these points will be brought up more in Jeff's talk, but, but the issues that we're confronting or the, the architectures like Roadrunner, as I showed, are becoming more and more heterogeneous and hierarchical. It's now, um, uh, we have more and more flops available relative to, to, to the bytes and it's more of a communication dominated uh, regime. So we need algorithms, we need programming models and, and tools that are also heterogeneous and hierarchical. Um, we can't have single scale bulk synchronous parallelism. The, the uh, effort it takes to, to even just do a, a global um, uh, uh, synchronization across a, a billion cores is, is enormous. Uh, on top of that, resiliency is more and more of a problem. We can't guarantee. We, we can't assume that we're going to have those billion cores from one time step to, to, to the next. Um, again, power is also an issue because of this. And as I mentioned along, the checkpoint restart issue uh, is also important. So finally, just summing up the, the fault tolerance and then uh, analysis and visualization, how do you do data reduction to avoid, uh, to kind of mitigate these, uh, the IO, uh, IO challenges. So feeding back to this HMM method that I mentioned, um, the, the approach that we're taking is, again, based on this, refining as needed to give you the con constitutive response using subscale models, uh, such as MD, finer scale models to drive forward the macro scale model. From a computational perspective, the, this, the, excuse me, one advantage of this uh, is that it's a task-based approach where you have independent, relatively independent work units. Uh, so say for each of these cells, as you need to compute locally the constitutive response, that may be uh, an MD simulation or phase field that we're, we're spawning off uh, to compute that. That's a fairly well-defined and contained task. So we can fire that off. It's independent uh, as far as um, um, it, it maps to heterogene it's heterogeneous because we have these different scales. Uh, since we have these multiple tasks, it, it kind of addresses the concurrency challenge by instead of trying to have a, uh, a billion way parallel single scale code, we may have a thousand million way parallel, which is kind of, which is doable, where, it's where we, we're at now. 
And then from the resiliency side, if one of those uh, thousand million way parallel jobs or tasks fails, we can just uh, reissue it. Um, so that's where we're trying to go. Um, let's see, so, so yeah, we're, we're coupling these different scales. Um, there's a whole similar set of pictures if, if we look purely in the time domain. Uh, instead of coupling different link scales, you can consider uh, for, uh, say, for modeling the evolution of radiation damage. Um, there are approaches uh, such as Kinetic Monte Carlo, where we're, um, uh, we have models for, for the evolution of defects within the material, um, and this relies on knowing what, those, what the defect structures and their migration mechanisms and rates are. Uh, this on-the-fly Kinetic Monte Carlo is uh, kind of accumulating this library, building it up by, by firing off these smaller scale tasks to use ab initio or MD to compute the, the possible uh, events and rates uh, along the way. So let me, um, let me just briefly, this is, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Again, related to some of the work, uh, this idea of building up a database, populating a database as you go along uh, by coupling scales has been shown by Livermore. Uh, and seeing those, this uh, kind of call to arms for task parallelism is addressing this. So finally, how do we get there? Um, the two current, uh, the way things are currently done is just unsustainable. They're currently, we, not in all cases, and this program is one of the exceptions, but, but uh, for a lot of uh, kind of code development projects, there are a set of application people who have kind of a fuzzy view of, of what the, the hardware and the operating system look like, uh, a very clear picture of what the problem they're trying to solve is and what the possible algorithms are for that. On the other side, the computer science people who, who uh, you know, may be developing the architectures and the middleware uh, have typically perhaps a, an outdated view of what the applications are. There may be an old set of, of benchmarks that they're, they're targeting. Um, they're kind of a, a approaching it from the other side. Uh, this isn't really sustainable. Um, so the, the way to move forward here is the so-called co-design process where we actually have the entire uh, set of people uh, from computer science, applied math for the algorithms, and, and domain science uh, for the applications working together to, to uh, kind of optimize, co-optimize these different aspects, the algorithms, the architectures, and the applications. Um, since time's limited, I'll, I'll kind of leave this. Um, just mention it, it's, it's not really new that there's back 50, 60 years ago, um, the case of the Maniac, um, it really was a, a kind of a co-design machine. Uh, in, in this case, since it was one of the first machines and it was, it was uh, built over a number of years, um, there was the opportunity for this close collaboration between the applications uh, uh, people and, and the designers, and in, in some cases, the lines blurred. Uh, so optimizing this over a number of years, uh, what was, was possible? So this is where we're headed. Um, since time is limited, I think I'll just stop there and uh, take any questions.